Thank you. Yes, yeah, so uh, I'll actually start today with basically giving a well, very rapid overview of the, the kind of observational surveys that are uh, happening now and in particular that are going to happen. And in the, the following lectures tomorrow, I'll focus them on one particular technique called weak gravitational lensing. Um, but as we'll see, that is the major driver for a lot of these cosmological surveys. Yeah, yeah so I know it's a bit early in the morning to be thinking about beer, but it, as, it, as it is hot and uh, we have to think of the future, Actually, a glass of Guinness in particular is a very good model for the universe, because this is, I think, one of the reasons why I hope you're interested in cosmology while you're here, because when we look at the universe, we basically see that the standard model of particle physics is incomplete. We see all this evidence for new physics because the stars, and perhaps even when we include the hot baryons, they are merely a prop. What, what, what we see of the universe is just a glimpse of what is beneath it, right? The bulk of the matter is dark matter, which we do not have a computer before, which we haven't detected yet. So who knows what it is, but we do know it's new physics, it requires new physics. And then arguably an even bigger problem is the dark energy, which part of the expansion of the universe to accelerate. And, yeah, we really have no satisfactory explanation. But right now, and I'll focus, of course, on the data. Um, but of course, we want to learn more about the new physics. And, and what is interesting is that if you look at the present day results, um, or basically, maybe if we, if we zoom back a little bit to, to the year 2000, um, Finally, if we focus on the Hubble constant, like when I was at old as you, there was still discussion about the value of the Hubble constant. But what we saw basically around the turn of the, the century, that basically something that we now call precision cosmology happened. We understood the probes better and actually things started to converge. And that's what you see here on the measurement of the Hubble constant that over time, in particular with the distance letters in the classical way, and CMB measurement. For about a decade, we're in agreement, and then Planck happened. And with Planck, um, what we see is that suddenly the error bars are shrinking, and the same is true for these direct measurements of shoes, but we now see disagreement. And so, a big question, ongoing debate is what is this? Is this real or is it systematic? As we'll see, actually, systematics, but like these measurements are incredibly difficult. Right? There's a reason why, after 100 years of trying this, we are just managing. Another interesting measurement, and that's focused on the lensing, so we'll talk about more in the coming uh, lectures, is that when we look at the clumpiness, lensing measures mostly clumpiness, a combination of the matter density and, and the normalization of the power spectrum called sigma A, but in combination, uh, basically measuring the variance of density fluctuations. And when we do this, we get these measurements, uh, sort of these big blue blocks, and then in red, we see the Planck measurement. And again, right, it's not overwhelming, but again, we see sort of a difference that is uncomfortably large. Right? It could still be statistical, but if the measurements improve, it doesn't seem to be going away. And now, the future sort of will settle this because here I sort of give an indication of the error bar of a future measure for future. Right? So, but in the next decade, we'll see a dramatic shrinkage in these uncertainties. But of course, right, the hope is that we might see the first cracks here because if so, then we have very good hope of really understanding the new physics. So, it, it will be quite uh, a significant signal to explore these future missions. But the question right now is, what is this? Is this new physics? Is this astrophysics? Because as we move forward, uh, none of the probes are really clean. And it's still statistical. But with more data, statistical errors, you 
objects disappear for the complex realm. But like we have this dark universe and we don't have a good theory. Or we can say, yeah, we have plenty of theories, but none really stands up. And so from an observational point of view, that's a very strange situation. Normally, when you design an experiment, you have actually quite clear specifications of your target. But we're now designing surveys without a clear target. We do have some idea, like if, if the dark energy or the accelerated expansion is caused by a cosmological constant, then it should have an equation of state of minus one. But of course, it's about the error. When do we give up on a cosmological constant? How small or how large should the deviation be? How small should the error bar be? We write a good theory, we just say, this is the value, we can test it, but we can't do this. So that makes it very difficult. And I think it's well captured by this uh, little sentence. I think that's really what we're after, right? We're looking for this black cat in a dark room, and so you can assign an experiment to do that. But what will you find if there is no cat? Right? So that, that is the challenge. Like if we search for the wrong thing, that's all we're going to find. We might miss the right physics, right? We might convince ourselves this is the model for the universe, but it's wrong because we don't have the sensitivity for the information. So that's the challenge. So then let's look at what, what can we study. When we look at this, what are the options? And so, well, we we need to be sensitive to dark energy, obviously, but also to modification of the law of gravity, because after all, we're applying general relativity. Cosmological scale, right? like the gross extrapolation of the theory. So far, it sort of seems to work, but at the same time, who knows? So, we should be able to also be sensitive to, to, the, to the gravity. Right? What we observe is a mix of gravity trying to pull things together and the expansion. So, basically, this mix the ingredients of the universe trying to uh, counteract that. And so, we can, and in addition, we need to imagine the world line. You can measure something, if you can't interpret it, it's useless. So we can look at the expansion history, right? This is how dark energy was discovered. So that's basically what the supernova measurements measure. And effectively, what you measure is how the equation of state changes with time. That's all it measures. Right? So you have a Friedman equation, there's W there, or you can make it oh, very complicated, but it's just that term in the Friedman equation that you measure with the cosmic expansion history. Something that is more complicated to compute um, is the history of the, how structures grow in the universe. Is now we need to combine the effects of gravity, and, and we'll see most of the process to, to, to nonlinear scale, so maybe in body simulation. So it's hard to make the predictions with pen and paper. And so that's why a lot of theorists tend to focus on this, claiming victory while failing this by thousands of cities. Right? So whenever you make a new theory that explains the universe, you better check this because it rules out most theories that fit this. Right? So uh, even though it's hard. Right? So this can be a first check of your theory, but it's by no means a reason to, to think it's working. All right, so we can measure the growth rate of structure, basically see how structures grow, and that's measuring a mix of the expansion history and the effects of gravity. <clears throat> so, okay, so now we sort of get a sense of what we want to measure, uh, and so let's think a bit further. So, how, what else do we need? Well, there's a reason why dark energy was discovered only 25 years ago. Because it's very, even though it's 70% of the universe, it's very hard to measure that the effects are extremely subtle. So we need high precision, which means a very large effect. But see here, I'm making a distinction between precision and accuracy, something that a lot of people get confused by. Precision says something 
about the size of your error block. And so that's why precision cosmology is easy. You just get a lot of data. What is much harder is accurate cosmology. That implies that actually that error bar gives meaning, right? That actually your central value of your measurements has actually any relation to the underlying truth, so that the biases are small. So we need very high accuracy. So we need to control all the things that can change the final result in exquisite detail. So that's nice. So then we have this. Now you get a funny result. How are you going to convince your friend? The only, well, you can convince them that you've done a careful job, but they don't like the result. So the best way is to have a second independent measurement that hopefully will give you the same result. Right? So you should also think of sort of building in complementarity. You can check consistency, but of course, once you combine these probes, you might actually also improve your, your measurements. And then very important, like right, we spoke in dark energy, but what is the problem with gravity? We really need to keep in mind that we want to, to pass the net as widely as possible observation. So to summarize, this allows us to sort of get a, a design. So we want to study the evolution of the universe, right? We want to see how structure changes over time, how the universe evolves. So we study evolution, which basically means we need redshift information. So it tells us the kind of information we need. Um, so the good news is that the accelerated expansion became dominant at low redshift. So that restricts the redshift range a little bit. So we can sort of focus mostly on redshift zero to two. Uh, this is why the CMB is of limited use for this kind of uh, studies. And then a bit more technical, if you want to at a fundamental level test gravity, if you look at the Einstein equations, right, there's two potentials there, a time-like and a space-like potential, which in GR are equal. This is why usually you just have one symbol there, one five for the potential. But strictly speaking, they need not be the same. And in modified theories of gravity, they typically are not. And so to test this, the most powerful way is to combine two probes, one that is uh, particular relativistic and one that is not, and they should be sensitive to the expansion history and the growth rate, and particularly the growth rate. But it's particular one should be non-relativistic non and the other one should be relativistic, which allows you to be sensitive because one is only sensitive to one of the potentials and the other one is sensitive to the sum. Okay, let's quickly review some probes then. So this is probably the one you've all seen because it's sort of the textbook, although this is not the measurement that, that resulted in the Nobel Prize. If you look at the 1998 measurements, that was a very marginal detection of, of the cosmic acceleration. But since, the, since then, the, the, these measurements have been improved dramatically and continue to improve. And so this relation between the distance and the redshift of the distance measured from supernovae really gives overwhelming evidence that the expansion is accelerating. But yet you can also try to modify gravity and basically change that expansion history. And they all fit these data. And that makes this of limited use moving forward. Because it's an infinite number of models that fit this. And most of these models get excluded by structure formation methods. Some of them are even excluded exponentially. That's a nice paper, uh, forget by who, where they make this point for a while. For very popular models is Chaplin gas, which literally caused exponential runaway flux to the point. Say we can't even show the constraints by how much they spill because the line on the paper cannot be drawn thin enough. Yet people continue to publish papers on a model that you could not even display how long it was. So, so keep that in mind as you work on models. Like there is no point on models that are no relation to the universe. So when we combine probes, 
we see that, that this is necessary because you see the supernova is an infinite number of models available, and that's because they measure the difference between the density and dark energy and the matter density. And so you get the W equation, so dark energy and matter density, you get basically a term like this. This is the degeneracies in these methods. <coughs> and what was the action? Each of these methods has their own degeneracies. Now, how do you really can measure energy? Uh, perfectly. Even the CMB, which measures really the sum of these components. Um, and then you have something we'll return to better acoustic oscillations, which measures mostly omega matter. But you see very good agreement. So in particular, you see the benefits of combining this complementarity of probes. Um, and I think that yeah, these kind of degeneracies, you really need three probes to sort of check things. But that sort of leads to sort of the choice that we have. And then I already alluded to what we really need to study moving forward on the nature of dark matter and dark energy is the structure of matter. And simulations, computer simulations are a very good way to visualize this as time progresses as the universe expands, gravity locally counteracts and structure forms. And the rate that the structures form is the balance between the strength of gravity and the amount of matter and the expansion of history of the universe. So that, that, that ratio changes over time. And so if we can look at the statistical matter distribution as a function of cosmic time, we can compare that to models of structure formation. And it allows us to check if the problem is on the right hand side, is it something like dark energy, which is sort of a container term for all possible explanation of accelerated expansion, or should be modified a left hand side, which is gravity. Mm -hmm. And this just shows an example. When you look at the clustering, there's a bunch of scale of red here. Here are two different cosmologies, one without a cosmological constant, one with a cosmological constant, scaled to look similar <laughs> at low redshift. <laughs> You see that as a function of time, so you can make things that look similar in the nearby universe, but this is the point of studying the evolution. By the time you're at high redshift, these cosmologies look very different. And of course, you can flip it around, you can start with the same initial condition, but you'll see that by the time you reach redshift zero, these universes look completely different statistically. And so, okay, so we want to, to map the matter distribution. <laughs> So how do we do this? Well, one way people have started looking at this is all, yeah, galaxies. So galaxies should trace the matter distribution. And so you can do this. So what we need then is just measure the positions of many, many galaxies and measure their redshift. So we have an estimate of the, the, the distance. Um, but so that's the precision part of the measurement, like lots of positions, lots of redshift. Lost uh, yeah. this part is still working. Um, yeah, we're back. And so, um, we need to. So, this is where the accuracy comes because okay, you pick the positions of galaxies, um, but. <laughs> If you do this from the ground, atmospheric variations lead to very subtle effects that affect your selection of galaxies. So you really need to understand and model where you're seeing galaxies. If you see, because the weather conditions were favorable, you see more galaxies here <coughs> than there, you might incorrectly think that there's some large-scale clustering in the universe, whereas it's really something atmospheric on Earth. And so you really need to model the, the selection of the galaxies, which is really, really hard. Um, but if you do, you can basically turn this into uh, a field of density fluctuations and measure the statistics of that. But there's a problem because life is not the same as matter. And this is a good example. <laughs> so, for instance, imagine flying on the International Space Station 
And your task is to figure out where do people live. So you fly over the US at night and you see this. And I love that. So you know that people live in cities. So you see that ah, those must be the cities. So you see this very clustered. Some people also are very clustered living in cities. And as you move out, there's less and less people. And so you notice, and they say, ah, but I see this back in the light distribution. So I see a lot of people live here. And here there's fewer and fewer people. <coughs> and so I can figure out how many people live in the US. Then you continue your flight, fly over China and India. Well, same pattern, but much less light. So it's clear from this study that half the people on Earth live in the United States. And you know that's not true. And that's because we assumed there was a linear relation between the amount of light and the number of people. But wealth on Earth is an important additional uh, parameter. Mm. And the same is true for galaxies. Not all galaxies emit the same amount of light given the amount of dark matter that surrounds them. So the process of galaxy formation complicates that very simple relation. And so when we look at galaxy formation, just a simple model is you have all these density fluctuations but if galaxies can only form above a certain threshold, then even though these, and it's, I admit it's a bad drawing, but even though this overdensity locally is similar to say this overdensity, no galaxy will form here. But because you have these sort of large scale waves on top, you have these smaller uh, densities. Here you get the galaxies forming. You see that they all clump together. And just from a simple threshold model, and in reality, things are more complex, but the general upshot is that galaxies do not, the formation of galaxies is much more <laughs> complex. So it's the local environment that plays a very important role. And so basically what we say, galaxies are biased traces of the matter distribution. Large scales, statistically, they capture it, but up to, in principle, unknown number. So we... So, so, and that's the challenge because we can't use the amplitude of the signal. So, that's the challenge, then, right? So, so because we we sort of see these galaxies, but can, we can't really use them for for very good measurements. Uh, so, one thing you can do, because in some cases we can try to figure out directly the amount of mass associated with the objects. For instance, in the case of a cluster of galaxies. In a cluster of galaxies, we can we see all these well, gas, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and we can try to measure their masses. Right? So that's the difference from the typical galaxy where we have trouble measuring the individual masses, but for a cluster, mm -hmm. they're sufficiently rare, we could set out and measure all their masses in principle. And so that allows us then look at the number density <coughs> of clusters. So those are really the peaks in the distribution. So we don't look at all the galaxies, we only look at the most massive galaxies. Um, so that's one strategy. The other strategy, uh, and that brings us to this barren acoustic oscillation, is right, what we saw in both Asia and North America, that people cluster in a very similar way. People cluster in cities. So those features, so even though we don't know the amplitude a priori, <coughs> Mm -hmm. We do see the clustering statistics. So the features may be preserved even though the amplitude is much more complicated to interpret. And these barren acoustic oscillations, you of course know because you've seen the power spectrum of the CMB fluctuations, CMB temperature fluctuation. Mm -hmm. right? Those are really these acoustic oscillations that are frozen in when mm -hmm. the, the universe became transparent. So on a scale of, uh, what is it, about 130 uh, megaparsecs or so, 150 megaparsecs, there is a sort of a, a ring of matter around each overdensity. And although that overdensity, here you see these really huge wiggles, over time, because gravity has done its job, and this is, these are the barriers, the atoms, but there are no wiggles in the dark matter distribution. Mm -hmm. And so over time, this, these wiggles have been suppressed, but they're still there when we look at the distribution of galaxies. So as time goes on, 
that, that those barrier acoustic oscillations get, get suppressed, but they are measurable. So we do expect to see these wiggles back and we can compute at what physical size they, the, the first harmonic peak for the model and so then all the other peaks. And so we can calculate it and relate this to the CMB. And so when we look at the distribution of galaxies, we expect when we take the power spectrum to see these same wiggles persist, <coughs> albeit at a lower amplitude. There's additional complications, but they're kind of minor. And indeed, we see them. So this is some progress over the, since the early detections about 20 years ago, or not even 20 years. But you can see, and this is all slow data, as the measurements got better, you can really see these wiggles when you subtract off or compare this to a pure dark matter power spectrum. So the dark matter has no wiggles. When you look at the galaxies, you see these very clear <coughs> wiggles. And these are what we call a standard ruler. They measure the length of something you know, you measure the angular size, and now you learn something about cosmology. Um, And, um, but like the supernovae, right, because the supernovae measures the luminosity distance, mm -hmm. this measures the angular diameter distance, they are the same, right, up to a factor one plus z. So, so they measure essentially the same thing. So this is a very clean way, probably, so probably the cleanest probe we have in cosmology next to the CMB, but it's limited use. There's no, at least these features have no sensitivity to gravity. All right, so that's what we would like to uh, keep in mind. Yeah. Right, but nonetheless, these redshift surveys played a very important role. If you look at Maybe, yeah, I'm not sure exactly. Times of probably in the 80s, definitely in the 70s, there was discussion how do galaxies form? Do they collapse from sort of big clouds and then they might fragment or evolve? Or do they form bottom up? Right? And we now all basically assume it's a hierarchical model such information because that's what computer simulations predict as a natural outcome from these initial conditions in the CMB. But it also matches very much the structures we see when we do redshift surveys. So when we uh, look at this, and I'm sure, yeah, at least from the back, I must be talking about the topology of, of these structures. Right? But when we look at the positions and redshifts of galaxies, um, yeah, you see definitely a very structured universe, which is the result of gravity in an expanding universe. And so they really played a key role in establishing how to how does structure form in the universe? And so what you see here is a very early result from the CFA, one of the very first surveys, painstaking work. Um, uh, and this is a coma cluster. And so it looks a bit funny, doesn't it? So let's look into that. So because there's an additional fact, right? Because we saw like these redshifts, so we have the expanding universe. And so basically using redshift right, as, a, as a measure of the distance using the Hubble expansion. But when you have something like a cluster, the interpretation becomes more complex because we have gravity and these structures have collapsed. And so even though the cluster as a whole moves along with the Hubble flow, individual galaxies also feel the presence of the cluster. And that leads to something we call redshift space distortions. So if you just had a regular expansion, then everything would move along. But let's now look at a structure that basically an overdense in the universe that is expanding and then eventually under the influence of gravity starts to collapse. And if you look at the cluster of galaxies, Basically, all these phases are present because the outskirts of the cluster, by definition, is something which has recently gained some attention called the splashback radius. That's where material is just turning around. Mm -hmm. 
And that radius, of course, gets larger and larger, but all the stuff inside has already collapsed and is moving in and is re-collapsing, et cetera, et cetera. But so when you look at when this is expanding in real space, what you're seeing that in redshift space, you sort of see a squeezing. And that's because the galaxies further away are moving a little bit faster than you thought they were. And so you're actually thinking that the density of galaxy drops off quicker because like, there's a little bit of a runaway effect in front and the back. So what you would observe, so if you had a nice spherical distribution of galaxies, if you make a plot in redshift space, mm -hmm. you'll see a slightly flattened distribution. And then at the turnaround, then you get the extreme flattening because all these galaxies are now exactly counteracting the Hubble flow. And so their peculiar velocity is exactly the, the excess difference. And so basically they all collapse into a thin line effectively. And then they collapse. And now you basically get the opposite effects. So instead of flattening, you basically get something what was referred to in the past as the finger of God. <laughs> Don't ask me why, but it's for sure elongated. Um, and so that's what you'd expect. So when you look at a cluster of galaxies, you see all of this at the same time because the inner regions have collapsed and you see this, this, this elongation. The outer regions are still collapsing. And that tells us something about structure formation. So now you see how we can use these redshift surveys if we can probe these very small scales very well. We can learn something about structure formation as well. So this becomes sensitive to gravity, in particular the matter density, but in print also, also gravity itself, right? Because this is testing how structures fall. And you can see this. So this is an old measurement from the 2DM redshift survey. And you really see this, this kind of onion. Here you see this, this extensions and this collapse structure, but you see also the scale. So you really want scales of several megaparsecs or less. You see this, this elongation. So that's where you see nonlinear structure formation, very complex. So you need simulations to really predict what it should look like. But in the large regions, you do see this, this flattening due to the infall. And by measuring, again, this as a function of redshift, we can learn something about the growth of structure. And this is driving much of these redshift surveys, both the barren acoustic oscillations, but also the ability to measure uh, redshift space distortion. And these surveys are getting larger. I showed you in the previous slide results from the 2DF survey, but 200,000 galaxies, the CLA survey was really thousands of galaxies, took them years to collect. Um, and then if we move the more recent surveys, the Sloan survey, you're looking at the million galaxies. Um, and this is all modern day digital uh, processing, even though the fibers were fed by I think some retired guy who basically enjoyed putting fibers in, in, the, in the right place. Uh, it's not my, but yeah, some people quilt and, and yes, uh, as long as he's happy with it. Um, but the main point is these surveys are growing <laughs> larger and larger, both in area. So when we look at barren acoustic oscillations, we're looking at things on very large scales. So we're, that drives the area we want to want to probe because we want to see as much of the sky as we can. But because it's large scales, we don't need very high galaxy density. So that's why you, you see like the boss survey set here in 2DF. They're sort of at at the given area, sort of at a quite modest galaxy density. And it's partly driven by the design of I don't know, these fibers as well, because you have fibers. They can they are patrol a sort of a region, but they can't get too close. So you, it's very difficult to reach very high spatial completeness with fibers. So they they sort of have uh, arc minute scales or less become very difficult to sample. And so that's why they naturally sort of fall in this regime. Um, but you can see there's also now, and these are. Uh, the new generation surveys that go both for area, but also push up 
the galaxy density, partly by pushing up a higher redshift so that automatically allows you to grow higher density, but they really aim to dramatically improve sort of the, the, the precision, but also this allows for the opportunities of redshift space distortions much better than is possible with these other surveys. And viewing it in another way, this is the, the, say, the measurement error on, on the distances to the BEOs. And, and mind you, and I'll show a similar plot when we look at imaging surveys for lensing, right? This is a long linear plot. This means that the error bars, at least on paper, are shrinking exponentially. Like that is really why now is such an exciting time for cosmology. But like all the work that has been done before is in, to some extent, just preparation. Because these new surveys, the error bars, like it's, it's just in a fraction of the data, they outcompete anything that has been done before. Right? So right now it's a really exciting time. And so DESI uh, is nearly complete as a survey in the US on the ground. And then of course Euclid, hopefully the next decade or so, um, will, will also provide additional measurements. And so DESI, so this is really driven also by the technology. Right? So, so in a way, the telescopes they're using, it's a little bit bigger, like Sloan and 2DF or small cameras. Uh, DESI is a four meter telescope, uh, existing four meter telescope. And here you see sort of how, uh, yeah, the fibers can be positioned. So uh, this is now done by a robot because once you do this kind of number of fibers, it's just inhumane to have people do this. Um, and this has to be continuous. So basically fiber, the 5,000 fibers can be positioned. And basically while one part is on the sky, the fibers for the next observation are already positioned. And it, this basically is a continuous survey, completely automated. And that allows you to now move on to tens of millions of redshifts. And basically, it will, based, I think, by the end of the year. So it's very close to finishing its first couple of years. Um, but basically, by the time they're done, they will have about 30 million redshifts for a third of the sky. Right? So that Sloan, which was a major feat, right? This, they, they were already outnumbered Sloan by a long shot right now. And they will continue to do so. And, and you really see how they can push now, also with quasars to very high ranges. There's a lot of additional science that comes out of that as well. But let's move back to, I think, a, also very appropriate in this country, uh, for the second author, um, a very powerful test of cosmology, because one of the fundamental assumptions we make, right, is that the universe is isotropic. And so now, if right, remember what I said, if things are collapsing, then we get this squeezing of the redshift space. But at some point, on a sufficiently large scale, like the BAO scale, gravity should play no role. So things should become isotropic. So these acoustic oscillations of the sky should be, when looked at in real space, should be spherical. And so when we look in redshift space, that basically means when we measure the redshift, the distortion on the redshift space, and look at the BEO signal, for instance, or any other feature in the radial direction, what we're measuring is something that is proportional to one over the Hubble constant. As of angular, of course, evolves. And then when we look on the angular relation, we get the angular diameter. And so if you have a model for the universe that basically tells us what the angular diameter distance are, then this alpha Pachinski test said, well, if you know this, well, basically this quantity should be equal to this quantity. We now have a measure for the Hubble constant because that's what allows us to stretch things or, or squeeze things a little bit until we basically get the same answer. And I think this is given what I showed in the, in the, in the second slide, I think. Uh, right, this whole current discussion on the Hubble parameter, I think this is something that will be settled very soon, well, or not, of course, um, because the question is what is causing this. But at least these BEO measurements will improve dramatically with something like DESI 
And on top of that, something like Euclid. Euclid will do a really great job in this redshift range. But this is a forecast for DESI of their measurement of the Hubble constant. Right? And, and you basically see that compared to what we have now, that's a dramatic improvement. And so that's what you see at all the fronts in cosmology, we see improvements on all these parameters thanks to these large servers. Now, as I said, we can also, right, that's all looking at the features. We can look at mm -hmm. the, the most massive objects, looking at clusters and counting them. And, and this is a, a good example where if you look at how many clusters you have as a function of redshift for different cosmologies, the number densities, even though you have the same number at low redshift, as a function of redshift, they change dramatically. But as part of my thesis, I wrote a paper on a single redshift 0.8 cluster showing that it wasn't very massive. But just the fact that it existed ruled out the omega matter equals one universe. <coughs> because if you just have omega matter equal this universe, these clusters cannot exist at high redshift. Well, or if you are extremely unlucky, uh, un well, or lucky depending on your, your point of view. Right? But so uh, measuring that as a function of redshift is really powerful. And by looking at galaxies, of course, these are, especially with large imaging servers, you can find them quite easily. Um, right? Because they have thousands of galaxies, these redshift surveys provide very good samples of clusters of galaxies. Um, and for instance, if you look at Euclid, particular high redshift, I think there's gonna be a bit of a revolution, whereas Euclid has deep infrared imaging, and basically we can find clusters out to redshift two down to fairly low masses. So you're really getting samples that are of the order of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of clusters. So whereas now we're working, or even I think in the late 90s, samples were of the order of 100. But so also there you see this big drive. And of course, it's all related because these are similar data sets that people are using. Um, but galaxies are still complicated. Um, and there's projections along the line of sight. So x-rays have historically been a major driver for cluster research. Right? Because there, most of the gas, most of the variants can be observed as, as hot X-ray emitting gas. And um, there was a lot of excitement through the launch of uh, Erosita, but as you may know, uh, because of the war in Ukraine, it has been paused. And there's all kinds of discussions whether the Russians are trying to hijack it. But for now, essentially, it's paused. Right? So there's a science mission in space doing nothing right now. But if it, well, they took some data, of course. Um, but really, it was really the next generation all sky x ray service with a much larger sensitivity compared to, for instance, the prior uh, Rosa mission. Um, it can find black holes, all kinds of things, which, of course, is important for understanding galaxy formation and feedback. Um, but for the purpose of this presentation, it would have found 50 to 100,000 clusters of galaxies out to redshift one. So here this gives you sort of an idea, like tons of redshift, low redshift galaxies, but again, something we can study very well in great detail, but also pushing out to a fairly high redshift, which is quite unique. So you get a very clean sample of clusters. And, and so they would have uh, measured all kinds of cosmological parameters quite well. Um, but as a warning, this X-ray emission but they always assume, oh, it's nice hydrostatic equilibrium. But this is what a merging cluster looks like. And that's much harder to interpret. So that's still a complication. Because when you do cosmology, you have to include these as well. But what is their selection function? Because they get shock heated, they, their X-ray emission increases. So it's very difficult to guarantee that we understand the astrophysics well enough to do very precise cosmological measurements. Now, there is a sort of uh, less extreme version of probing the, the hot intercluster medium, and that's by looking at the scattering of CMB photos, something called the Sunyaya Seldovich effect. So, 
the, the, CM, the hot, the, the, the cold CMB photons scatter off these very hot electrons and basically exchange energy. And so the spectrum of the CMB in the direction of a cluster shifts a little bit. And you see this when you now do this, because this is another field, which I won't be talking about much, but it's going really fast. The CMB, uh, high resolution CMB measurements, which by default and also allow for CI cell width measurement. And a cluster, so this is a, a, a CMB region of about 200 square degrees. And when you look carefully, you see these black dots in there. And these black dots are exactly where there's a cluster of galaxies. And at that location, the CMB photons, the, that spectrum has been shifted, and at that location, things will cool. And so you can find now with these very large surveys, because they are getting more sensitive, survey more area of sky, they're also finding thousands of clusters of galaxies um, that, that need to be studied. Um, but, and so that brings me soon to, to gravitational lensing, and also the moment to stop, is that when you look at current cluster studies, they're limited by how well we can determine the masses of the clusters. So there's no shortage of clusters. Any cluster survey right now is limited by the mass calibration. In that sense, there's little point in doing more clusters because we need to understand both their selection, but in particular also what their masses are. Right? But this is a very appropriate picture to sort of sketch what cluster cosmology is about. Because you have things in projection, you need to figure out the mass, um, and clusters are also not well-defined objects. It's not like here is the boundary and, and basically have a circle around it. And so that's really the, um, the transition. Because so far I haven't talked about lensing, so I've talked about all these other probes, but of course, the rest of the lectures will focus also on gravitational lensing because that allows us to measure the matter distribution in the universe directly. And so that's, I think, a good moment to break. So we do a 10 minute break before we yeah. continue. Thanks. Thanks. No, we can a cup of coffee. Yeah. So you have three short questions. So, okay, so now let's continue with uh, basically looking at really where the matter is, is the invisible part. And so density fluctuations in the universe distort space time. And basically when we look at the universe, it's not the universe as it is but it's this distorted version of the universe with all the dark matter between us. And we'll talk about this more tomorrow, but by measuring, so basically what you get is distortions in the shapes of galaxies. And by measuring these shapes, we can actually reconstruct the distribution of matter. Um, so I think that is important for today is that we can see where the dark matter is. We can make a picture of the dark matter um, independent of the dynamical state of, say, clusters. These are two, well, probably familiar with the bullet cluster. There's another very uh, well-known merging clusters. Like in the x-rays, this is a mess. We think that here, three, so this is a simple case with two clusters bumping into each other. Here, we think it's three or four clusters coming together. Remember, these clusters are where all the filaments connect, right? So there's a lot of stuff happening there as material falls in. But the real driver of, of uh, development in, in weak gravitational lensing is something called cosmic shear. So that will be the last lecture tomorrow, where we just take this to the extreme and look at the statistics of the correlations in the shapes of galaxies as a function of angular scale. And so basically what we're doing is relating the statistics of dark matter in the universe, or the clumpiness of dark matter. We saw this earlier in this, in this simulation, how, how the universe gets clumpy um, uh, as, as, uh, in, as gravity pulls things together. The statistics of that, we can measure directly 
using gravitational lenses. So this is what makes it so powerful. There's no assumptions about whether galaxies trace dark matter, you're measuring the dark matter directly. And so the challenge is to measure growth of structures. The problem is that lensing, and again, details will come tomorrow, is that lensing is really measuring a projection along the line of sight. And it measures everything in projection, but there is a way by splitting these distant galaxies by their distance to sort of figure out which part of the universe along the line of sight contributes to this column of dark matter. And so that's something we call tomography, where we measure the growth of structure as a function of cosmic time using photometric redshift. So we do get a way of, of seeing how structure grows in the universe. And also, so for this, we measure shapes, we, we take imaging data, and also those surveys are increasing rapidly. Um, and again, you see sort of, this is sort of your, your fixed available telescope time. You can go deep over a narrow region, or you can go shallow over a large region. And this is sort of where we are right now, or what the kilodegree survey, BES. Um, but this is not everything, because with a figure like this, there's many other hidden parameters, what redshift range, how well can you do the tomography, um, but, but the main message is that these surveys are now probing onto the next range Euclid and LSST. We're looking at basically exhausting the best parts of the sky. And again, we see this exponential increase in the amount of data or the, in principle exponential decrease in the error box. In practice, as I said, the challenge is to deal with the accuracy so even though the amount of data increases exponentially, um, our understanding maybe increases linearly. And so as a result, we're sort of still improving the measurements, but um, we're still not there that we can fully exploit the data. But looking ahead at the, at the, the data, um, so a very important telescope on the ground will be the Rubin Observatory. Uh, which is uh, nearing completion. Um, so the expectation is that the survey, although it's been delayed because of COVID, which affected the construction, um, but it's a new, a brand new eight meter telescope designed for weak lensing um, and much more. But the original driver for, for the Rubin Observatory or the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, as it was called at the time, um, wants to do lensing, but they do it in such a way that they don't go one pointing at a time very deep. They just go several times a week, they take data. And so the time component of this uh, is just going to be phenomenal. So this will really unlock a completely new dimension of time domain astronomy. Right? But, and so basically it has a very large field of view, very large telescope. So it's going to be phenomenal in terms of depth. And you can see that Typically, if you look at the main survey region, um, right, they will return to the same part of the sky about a thousand times in a uh, sort of 10 year period. Right, so so right, the old days of going to the telescope because you have an interesting galaxy to look at. Well, here I can imagine because it's in the Northern Hemisphere, but if you're in a Southern Hemisphere, you'll never ever do that because you just download the data better than you're going to get with your own telescope and you can get a whole time series and increase depth. So this is also really changing observational astronomy. Right? Because a lot of telescopes effectively are being put out of business because the data are already there before you even thought of collecting it. So, right, so this is a sort of quick recap of, of the situation. So, oh, I, I sort of probably missed some probes, but these are the, the ones I focus on are the more competitive probes in cosmology, all the ones that are being used by Ruben and Euclid, etc. Um, right, but so this is sort of the summary, and this was my point. When we look at distances like supernovae, CMB, BAO, we are limiting ourselves to a very specific part of possible models of 
that explain dark energy. We're completely missing the modified gravity side of things. And so this is why a lot of work nowadays focuses on the clustering of matter. And, and, uh, and so it turns out, because Euclid, for instance, does both. And that, I would say that's a, a perfect match. Because remember what I said about modified gravity, that it would be particularly good to have a relativistic probe and a non-relativistic one. Well, galaxy clustering is non-relativistic, whereas gravitational lensing is a relativistic effect. Right? It's the bending of light as predicted by general relativity. So lensing measures the sum of these potentials, um, whereas galaxy clustering only measures one of them. And as it turns out, they require very similar sky areas. So if you can design your project that they can look at the same part of the sky, you get a very nice redundancy. So you get multiple measurements on the same part of the sky from lensing and galaxy clustering. And that would really be a very powerful probe. So that's really the driver for Euclid. And that's where I spend most of my time on, um, on, on the lensing side. Um, so the launch remains still uncertain because also there we were impacted by the war in Ukraine because Euclid was designed to be launched on the Soyuz, um, which is clearly out of the question now. Um, Euclid itself is ready, but we don't know which launcher we will use. So there's, there's good hope. Um, there's being investigated if we can go on uh, uh, an American launcher, and that could go pretty quick. So it might still be in the running for end of next year, or 2024, or 2025. Right? So, or 2026, I guess it never end. But really, we would hope to launch end of next year. So it's quite strange to be this to have your telescope ready, and then still don't know when you can start, which is complicated. But yeah, so Euclid is designed to do both lensing and the clustering of galaxies over a very, very large part of the sky. And it does so by splitting the light because the clustering is done in the infrared and the imaging for lensing is done in the visible. So we can keep, we can do both measurements simultaneously. And it leads to other complications, but it's sort of under control. So that's the idea. So it's sort of we really survey simultaneously uh, and have some infrared imaging and, and combine it with ground based data. But again, the numbers are staggering. We'll look at a third of the sky. So we don't look at the ecliptic plane where the planets are because the dust there makes that area very noisy. We don't look at the galaxy. And so the rest of the available sky, 50,000 square meters, is basically uh, what we'll look at. And I'll give you a, a sense, try to give you a sense of the data quality. Because again, this is going to be revolutionary because the data quality is comparable to that of the Hubble Space Telescope. Except we take way, 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 way more data. We'll measure shapes for about 2 billion galaxies. And again, measure redshifts for about 4 to 30, billion, 30 million galaxies. So Euclid will be launched to L2, the second Lagrange point, where currently James Webb is uh, also. Uh, and we do this because we want to measure the shapes of galaxies very, very well. And so what we want is a thermally stable telescope so that enough, well, things will change, but that it changes as little as possible as we take the observation. So Euclid is really designed to be a very, very high precision experiment. Right? And that pushes all kinds of boundaries on, on the modeling, on the calibration. It's very, very different from, say, the Hubble Space Telescope, which is good data, but if you were to collect a lot of, combine a lot of data, a lot of knowledge about the instrument, say, it is lacking, and with Euclid, we want to avoid this. So it's also doing a redshift survey, and it does so in a, by, by dispersing the light. So it's a slitless spectroscopy. So you have the image, and you just disperse all the light, which, of course, is a nightmare to work with. Uh, but the trick is to also take the observations at, a, at an angle, and so that allows you to disentangle 
the overlapping light from sources because in one image they will be overlapping and the other image they won't. And of course you can do more advanced data processing techniques to really extract spectra from the combinations of images. Um, but so this is really allowing you to measure redshift with a very clean selection. So this is the key bit. So DESI takes the same number of galaxies, but they need to somehow figure out how the atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera, was affecting their galaxy selection. In Euclid, the selection is blind because we just disperse an image, we see a spectrum, yes or no. But everything else is very much under control. I mean, that is what is driving these space missions, is the, is the need that if you want to really do a very, very definitive dark energy measurement, the systematics have to be under control. And for BEOs, it's, it's going to do really, really well. So this is sort of gives an indication of the current state of the art, maybe a little bit old, but still for the purpose of effect, I think it works very well because this is sort of what Euclid would get, and this is 20% of the data. It's just one redshift slice, and well, you can really see the barren wiggles with very, very high precision. And here, yeah, you can see them if you squint too high. All right, so really, just to hammer home the point, so this is sort of what we can do now. And this is what it would look like with Euclid. And to some extent, this wretched range DESI will probably do something quite similar. But Euclid pushes to higher wretched, so that combination with DESI is also very, very powerful. Now, to so just put another perspective more on, on the area I'm working on the lensing side is Euclid is really a high definition view of the world. And I'm sure you've all seen the Hubble pictures. So I deliberately show this in black and white because we only take one image, one filter individual. Of course, we could combine with the near but this gives a more fairer representation. All the pictures that Hubble took in the last 25, 30 years, that takes us a few days. And then we continue for six years. So that gives a bit of a sense of the amount of data. So all the Hubble pages, that just, we would just do this in, in a couple of days. Takes no effort. Um, because the Hubble camera is simply too small for really cosmological studies. Right? The largest field, the cosmos field that Hubble took, significant effort that takes us four pointers. Because this is our field of view. So basically, six by six, 4K by 4K CCDs, and single Hubble exposure with ACS. Right, so a single exposure that we take is 140 times larger area. Right, this is how we gain it. Right? We just do one thing, and if we start off with a factor of 100 improvement. Because this image then would be 160th of the survey. I just want to ask you one question. So, would we ever see this like this? Or, or so, 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 would Euclid ever see the moon? Mind you, Euclid is at L2. Yeah, because we're at L2. If we see the moon, that by definition means we're pointing into the sun. Right. So, so we'll never see this, but for effect, this this shows. like we're always looking 90 degrees away from the sun. And that also restricts the server because we want to keep the same thermal loads. So even though in principle we could look anywhere, if we tilt this, then basically we get different amount of sunshine at different locations. So we always keep the same and we can only rotate basically on this great circle on the sky. And so basically, as we move around the sun, we do our survey. So that makes the survey very complex. It's often very, you also see that within you that people do not find graphs that you can't just point anywhere. So we do have seasons. But just again, to, to give you an idea, so I mentioned Rubin. So a very good proxy for the Rubin data are the data from the Superru uh, survey. A high surprise survey, and they draw, for instance, the cosmos field. 
And so, right, you look at this, like LSSD is going to be phenomenal. Mm. Right? And this gives you a real taste of what LSSD looks like. But of course, the Cosmos field was first absorbed by, by Hubble. And as I said, Euclid is very similar to Hubble, also in depth, a little bit poor resolution, but, but negligible. So this is what Euclid would see in the same part of the sky. So which one is better? So in principle, right, so the, the ground-based data are very deep. And so they give the appearance of depth because, well, they are extremely deep, but because everything is blurred, you get the sense that, that faint objects are more apparent. But if you look carefully, you can see pretty much the same objects. So the difference, and we've also for lensing, we've done studies, that when you look at where the difference is, it's really at the most faint objects where, yeah, Ruben will see something, but it's not clear what you're going to do with them. Whereas Euclid basically sees all the useful objects. So that's going to be super exciting. Um, another area, because we have this high resolution, um, Euclid will completely transform basically the study of the matter distribution of really small scales using strong gravitational lensing. So tomorrow I'll mostly focus on the cosmic shear, the weak lensing, but of course there's a whole other side of gravitational lensing with multiple image objects. And again, Euclid will transform this because we go from a few hundred lenses known today to order 100,000. So now you, you have your gravitational lens, you cherish it, you, do, you spend months studying it, with Euclid, you get a thousand of those. You don't have a month to study it. You have to speed up the analysis and start thinking of strong lensing in statistical ways, which people are starting to do. And of course, we'll get very rare configurations with maybe three sources lensed along the line of sight, which really provides very important insight into the nature of dark matter the clumpiness of dark matter, but also the, the radio density profile. So this is something also very exciting. And again, to sort of hammer on the point, although there's been more objects uh, detected, this was a few years ago, a very large study of strong lenses using uh, Hubble. So this is 100% of that survey, and people are still studying these. This is 2% of Euclid lenses. But then again, it's completely transformed, it will completely transform this area and, and will do so much more than, for instance, Rubin does because Euclid has these sharp images. Because your typical Einstein radius is 0.3 to 1 arc second. So in ground based data, you're only getting the more extreme lenses, but with Euclid, you pretty much find them all. So, as I said earlier, Euclid is almost ready for launch. So this is the, the real camera that the, we're using. Um, this is actually a picture from, uh, let's say, two weeks ago, uh, with Euclid for the first time completely integrated for launch configuration in tour. So it's done. Except there's one final test, so it's being shipped to come for the final test in a, in a thermal vacuum chamber that is there. If it passes that test, so sometime in the fall, it's ready. But you just need to put it on a rocket. Um, and so this then sort of shows how the sky gets covered. So this is what I said. We, we don't look at the ecliptic, so this is empty. We don't look at the galaxy, so we leave that empty. But the rest of the sky, will survey. And as you see in different years, these are, this is the first year, so we we'll start in the sort of the, the ecliptic caps and then move our way uh, sort of towards the ecliptic. Right? But that again, um, yeah, we're looking at time scales, right? So now if you're a PhD student moving we'll into postdoc or just starting with this model, you like this is really, really exciting time with all these data coming. Like if I sort of compare it, I started with uh, chips that were, uh, I guess that I started with, well, really with uh, 2K by 2K, but, but really the work started with a camera that had 
2,000 by 4,000 pixels. Like it's like it's a time where like I guess 40 gigabytes was a lot, and now these are generating terabytes uh, every night if not more. Right, so there's a real exponential rise in the amount of data. Um, but as I said, we're also really trying our best to, to keep amongst them on the on the on the systematics. And so these are the instruments for Euclid. So as I said, so basically the light comes in, we have what is called the dichroic that splits the light. So the infrared light goes to the near infrared imager spectrogram, which is here, and then the visible light goes to this thick detector. And so that allows us to do very efficient observations. So first of all, of course, we can observe 24 seven. And we also do basically two surveys simultaneously. So that makes this a very efficient survey instrument. Um, and uh, although, I guess, a lot of work is needed to make sure we achieve this, but these are the forecasts um, made now about uh, 10 years ago, but also there's a lot of work preparing the, 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 the sort of real analysis code for Euclid, and, and we keep confirming that actually these original estimates we made uh, 10 years ago, we're still on track to achieving them. Right? So these measurements, even though we've learned a lot more about complexities, at the same time, we're also learning a lot more about structure formation, so that we're quite hopeful that we will reach some percent precision on dark energy from, uh, parameters. And this is sort of what I was talking about earlier, right? And the nice thing of complementarity. But the galaxy clustering and lensing are basically, if you look at how good they are as a cosmological probe, they are amongst the best in terms of constraining power, and they're quite comparable. Right? So that's good. So we can compare results, but especially there's a gain once you compare, combine them all, because if you combine lensing plus clustering, then suddenly your error bar shrinks. So if you're happy with both, then that combination is particularly powerful. That, that, so that's again what drove the design of Euclid. So you have these very good complementary probes that allow you to test things, but then also improve things once you're happy with the results. And again, we see the same when we look at uh, so this gamma is a measure for modified gravity theories. And again, they are very complementary, very similar in constraining power. And then once you combine them, uh, they do extremely well. Um, yeah, I'll skip this. So then the upshot is, and that is sort of bringing us back to the beginning, that although I can't guarantee we will find the right theory, uh, Euclid at least is designed to be as sensitive as possible to pretty much all aspects of the current cosmological paradigm. Like we, we are designed to measure dark energy with unprecedented accuracy, <clears throat> but also test gravity, right? So we're really keeping those options open. Um, as I said briefly, when we look at the, particularly the strong gravitational lensing, we're also having a very unique probe on the nature of dark matter. In particular, if you have warm dark matter, that will influence the statistics of the strong lensing on small scale. So we do hope that we can put constraints on the nature of dark matter for sure. And I haven't talked about it with cosmic shear and in particular as a cosmological probe, we will basically do it. There's a minimum mass of for the neutrinos. Our error bar on the neutrino mass is such that we will detect the neutrino mass, right? That's guaranteed. So that's, I think, very powerful because ground-based experiments in particle physics cannot constrain this. You can only constrain the mass differences. So that constraint will come first from cosmology. And then another aspect is initial conditions combining with Planck, of course, looking for deviations from non-Gaussianity. So can we learn something about inflation? Although we're not designed to do this, we will actually uh, play quite an important impact there. So I'm not doing that work alone. So this is from a time some while ago when we have a consortium meeting in Leiden. Uh, so Euclid is a very, very big team. Not everybody works the same amount, but nonetheless, it's, it's 
uh, something like 1,500 to 2,000 scientists and engineers working on this project. So this is really also changing. Right? So not only is the amount of data rising exponentially, so is the number of scientists involved in these projects. And actually, that's much harder to deal with than the actual science because everybody wants different things, etc. So managing people is uh, also very difficult. Um, but it's, it's worth it, right? I think everybody's excited uh, the way things are going. And I think to, 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 to end, right, so, so far I focus on the data. Tomorrow I'll focus a little bit more on, on some of these aspects, but I can't possibly touch on everything. But I think that is very important to keep in mind that when you look at the accuracy required and the precision afforded by the data. When we look at something like Euclid or Rubin or Desi, everything matters. Like we almost, so things that people have done for maybe all their life, we have to revisit whether or not it introduces bias. Because once you have large error bars, a lot of things can be ignored. But once your error bars shrink, they start hitting all the systematics. And that's what we're seeing with Euclid. So that's, was the very observational part of things, but there's also statistical ones. Like, like is the likelihood Gaussian? How do you compute unbiased covariance matrices? Um, and then on the theory, um, all kinds of astrophysical complication, but also how well do we understand nonlinear structure formation? There's a lot of work that still needs to be solved, a lot of problems that need to be solved. Um, but Nonetheless, I think, well, I think I see that as an opportunity. So it's a very exciting time for cosmology. And I think that, that really, we're, right, we're starting to touch upon some very fundamental questions on the cosmological model that we hope, of course, there's no, never a guarantee, but we really are making tremendous progress in the next decade. And um, yeah, I think this is a, a great time to think also what you want to do with the data, the testing the theories, etc. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. So, so, and some of you, you are confused. So go with the question. Yes. Uh, thank you for a very nice talk. I, I have a couple of questions. So first, uh, could you go back to the slide of the energy state of the of the equation of state of dark energy? Okay. Yes. Okay. I wonder why uh, we have on the right slides mm -hmm. for high redshifts. There's uh, we have a Lansing and Gauss equestrian, and it looks like I don't know exponentially worse. The error bars are exponentially worse. While on this red red band, it's the errors are well, well contained. What is happening here? Why is it so different? Yeah, so, so what you often see is that, so the individual probes, um, yeah, it's not so much clear here, but so this is just everything together. But what you often see, so here in the co co combination, you see that you're, you're improving a lot. And that's because things tend to behave differently at different redshifts. And so I think in this case, actually, it might be a model, so it, it might be quite deceiving, but usually what you have is that, so at each probe by themselves doesn't do very well, but at different redshifts, they look completely different, and that breaks the degeneracies. Um, of course, that, and that is still the, the aim of the game, is like, if you gain this much, would you trust the result, right? Because any error in one of the probes would immediately sort of give you a false sense of, of uh, accuracy. But, but, but yeah, it's really what you're seeing here is these, these breaking of degeneracy. So each probe on ourselves isn't, well, it's still way better than we have now, but it's once you combine that you really get the big gains. But it comes with a risk. Yes, I was just a bit confused because when we uh, look at the other uh, well, combined measurements we see these banana sheets, which look with a very clear intersection. And here, these uh, edges, like, they, look, they don't look like they look quite uh, extra data on top. Yeah, but that's also so, so current data is just not good enough 
to constrain. So, so that's also you're hitting, at some point, once you do real tomography with lensing in particular, then again, you get these rotating sort of bananas. And so once you have that, you can do a lot better. Okay, and my second question is about uh, testing the cosmological principle. So what do you have in mind exactly? Yeah. Well, so yeah, there's two ways, right? So if you do the alpha Pachinsky test, you're assuming it's isotropic. And so then you're using that assumption to figure out the Hubble parameter, but you can also try to leave it free. And so of course these large surveys, they probe such large portions of the sky that you can try to test this um, by sort of see how homogeneous are things. Uh, so there's a large review by Amendola, uh, on Euclid, where they discuss a lot of these different ideas. But so that, that yeah, so if you do isotropy, then that's, then you can't do the alpha Pachinsky test by definition. Yes. So uh, would this help us to determine the, say, the local bulk flow, or just if we are the tilted observers? Yeah, so Euclid. So it really focus on high redshift. So I think a lot of that would come from more local surveys. So it's also on the south. Um, so I like sort favoring the, the southern hemisphere. There's the Desi Bright Sun. So it's, yeah, so I think um, so I don't know exactly, but yeah, there's a lot of low redshift data that is improving also dramatically. Okay. Yes. A uh, quick question, with all the challenges that uh, Euclid's data flops and other uh, projects, uh, other large surveys with, uh, will um, bring in the future, what kind of skills would you recommend young researchers to take up uh, if they want to engage in future uh, research? Is there any skills, like tool sets that will be necessary, but there's perhaps a lack of right now among uh, students and faculty members. Yeah, so it's hard to uh, predict the future, but yeah, I think what if I would say the important thing is to um, keep your eye on the ball. I think that is the more important thing with what I see now, and that um, does bother me, is that so say somebody works on a theory, and, says, and then you point out some astrophysical bias, and they're like, not my problem. That's a very bad attitude, I would say. Right? Because the top scientist, like, and I think Jim Gunn is a good example, right? he, just, he wrote some of the first papers on cosmic shear in the 60s, then sort of looked at structure formation. And it's like, okay, so I need to design the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which he did. And then developers, and now he's doing another. So basically, that's why he, he just wants to understand the universe and builds and develops whatever is needed. And what I see now is at times, and of course, you can't do everything, right? So it's, it's uh, and people like Jim Gunn are very rare, of course. But I think it is a bit of a concern that people will make forecasts for something like Euclid and show no interest in the systematics that completely can dwarf their prediction. Right? Because then you're like, what's the point if we cannot measure it? So I think that is important to, I would say what is important to spend at least some time trying to understand the experiment. So and are you saying that people will only place for you first to solve? <laughs> well, you see there are people being confused about things we cannot measure. They're like, why don't you measure it? Well, because you can't. And so you find, need to find the balance. It might be necessary to understand things in the end. Sure. But the balance now sometimes is sort of, it's comfortable to not think about the experiment. And so you need to, of course, you need to design, plan ahead. So you need to say, okay, what could be done? But writing a paper that you can measure something and you look at the experimental specification, like there's no way that is ever possible, I think you're missing the point. Right? So, so making forecasts in an ideal world where the experiment has clear limitations, I think then you should 
try to understand the limitation because then you can influence also the data processing decisions. And, uh, and so there's many, many examples. So I think that is a concern that there's this drift where on one side people just assume the data are perfect, which to some extent was the case for the CMB. So maybe that's also hardly an explanation. The CMB data are extremely clean. You look at the temperature map, you can do science with that map. For large construction measurements, the measurements themselves require very complex interpretation. And so that requires you to sort of get a sense of what are the limitations of the experiments um, and, and, uh, yeah, and even help with sort of solving some of these experimental issues. But that's, I think, is where I think the main challenge is, is that um, really crudely said, right, 100 Fisher matrix inversions are not very useful if we don't have the people dealing with some of the instrumental effects. Any after the Yanks, you can say any no answer. Okay, we are ready for coffee and thank you very much again.